Uh, is it full screen now? No? Still not full screen? I'm sorry, it's not full screen, so yeah, it's fine. Uh, I'll just keep going. So now instead of just separating colored compounds, we can use chromatography as a catch-all name for techniques that separate compounds based on their physical chemical properties. For example, the mass, their polarity, their chirality, so on and so forth. So back in school, we remember that when we place a little dot of a mixture at the bottom of a paper and we let it separate, right? We dip the piece of paper inside some solvent like water. And then we see these beautiful colors get separated over here on the right, right? Certain colors uh, travel different distances. For example, this peach color travels D1 and this uh, solvent, right, which is water, it travels D2. The distance the solvent travels, we call it the solvent front, yeah? So one thing that, one property that we can gain from these chemicals is the retardation factor. I'm sorry for the name, but that's really what it's called, the retardation factor. Or rather, uh, how readily that compound is separated from the solvent front. So quite simply, we take it as D1 divided by the solvent front distance, right? So actually, one of the things that you might have learned back in school was that people use chromatography or paper chromatography to separate uh, medical drugs, right? Certain compounds. So when you spot them over here at the start line, if we say that uh, they both contain this peach colored uh, compound, right? We say that they are the same if they've traveled the same distance or have the same retardation factor. So one way we can extend paper chromatography into a more robust and interesting method is through using a plate, right? We replace our thin piece of paper with a plate coated with a material that interacts very strongly with the molecules that we're interested in separating. Now these molecules that we want to separate are usually called analytes in the field, right? So this piece of paper can instead be replaced with a thin sheet coated with a silica gel or aluminium oxide. Because this piece of paper does not move, we call it the stationary phase. While the solvent does move as it travels up the paper, we call it a mobile phase. Yes? Yeah, uh, hi, Philosophy. Do you have any questions? Oh, no, he just joined. Never mind. So, polar and lights, right? Because the stationary phase is polar, they'll interact very strongly. So, you can think of it as a bit like glue, right? Because the paper or the sheet, right, is coated with a glue that interacts very strongly with polar materials, polar, uh, polar analytes will have a very hard time migrating up the plate, right? So they interact very strongly with the plate, but very weakly with the non-polar hexane. So uh, when I said that you need to have like such a kind of high school level of chemistry knowledge, uh, what I mean is you have to understand what polar and non-polar interactions are, right? Uh, if anyone has any trouble with polar or non-polar interactions, please say in the chat. Otherwise, this will not work out for you. Oh, wait, what chat do I use? Uh, just the class. So this is, let's take an example, okay? Here we have uh, three different compounds, right? They're separated based on polarity. Non-polar molecules strongly interact with non-polar solvent or hexane and get pulled up the plate, right? But polar molecules interact with the coating on the plate, for example, silica or aluminium oxide. Therefore, they resist movement. So in chromatography, we say that the separation of our different uh, analytes is because of the differential interaction between the mobile phase and the stationary phase, yeah? So let's take uh, this previous example here. We see that this group ha is a carboxyl, right? Carboxylic acid. This one is an alcohol in the middle, and the top one is just a hydrocarbon, right? So because the hydrocarbon uh, is just a hydrocarbon chain, it interacts very strongly with hexane through hydrophobic interactions, van der Waals interactions, so on and so forth. Whereas because the these groups have uh, oxygens in them, we say they're slightly more polar, right? Very polar, in fact. So what they do 
is that they bind. They interact very strongly with the oxide groups inside the inside the polar uh, stationary phase. Right. One example uh, this can happen is through hydrogen bonding. For example, the OH here has a H which can interact very strongly with the O on the aluminium oxide or silica dioxide. Yeah. So this can also be extended to calculating RFs, right? Retardation factors, because the ones that are the most polar, right? Uh, in this case, uh, oh, sorry, this is this is wrong. Uh, ignore the low and high RF. I got that off the internet. Uh, benzyl alcohol actually has the. Oh no, it's correct. Sorry, uh, benzyl alcohol has the lowest RF because it's traveled the smallest distance. Right, because uh, benzaldehyde actually traveled the medium distance, so it has middle RF, and ethyl benzene has the highest RF. Right. So actually, uh, with regards to thin layer chromatography, we can generalize these uh, chromatography techniques to a surface. For example, we know the solvent is flowing in one direction, right, along a uh, mobile phase. And there's a coated surface that the it interacts with the stationary phase, right? So eventually, all these end lights, the green ones and the red ones, will end up at the detector. If we pretend that this coated surface, uh, the stationary phase, is a polar substance, do we expect polar or non-polar substances to be more easily retained on it? Uh, that's a question. So, do we expect polar substances? To be retained on the polar stationary phase? Yes, we do. Because they have several different interactions they can undergo. They can uh, basically undergo polar interactions, they can undergo uh, hydrogen bonding. But these uh, green colored analytes, the less polar ones, right, they move along with the solvent, typically hexane, acetone, or some other non-polar liquid. Yeah? Is anyone confused yet? Am I going too fast? Please let me know in the chat. Or just tell me I'm going too fast. Uh, right. So let me revisit this idea one more time just to make sure everyone understands. So because uh, same attracts same, that's the law we're going for polarity and non-polarity. Right? Because the mobile phase here, hexane, is non-polar, it attracts the things that are equally non-polar, for example, uh, this hydrocarbon over here at the top. But the stationary phase is polar, so it attracts uh, these polar molecules. It's almost like friction in a way, if you can think about it that way as well. Yeah. So basically, what do how do we expect uh, this profile to turn out with the red and lights being polar? and the green and lights being non-polar, right? Actually, once you're de they're detected over here, using this detector, right? We have a chromatogram or a profile uh, quite like this, yeah? This blue peak here is just the mobile phase. The green peak corresponds to uh, these green and lights, and this red peak corresponds to these red and lights. Now, why are the green peaks being detected at low time? because they travel faster, so they get detected first. But the red end lights, right, they're very strongly attracted to the polar stationary phase, so they get retained and they uh, get detected later. Okay, math. Uh, I know many of you hate math, and I do as well, but uh, this, these are very common definitions that you'll look at in chromatography. Alright, so T0 is the retention time of your mobile phase. Uh, in general, TR right, is the retention time or the central point of each peak. For example, the green curve over here, we see that the retention time is the middle of the peak. You see this dotted line going down? TA. For uh, the red and lights, the retention time is the center of this wider peak over here. That's TB. Okay, so uh, the capacity factor right, is uh, basically a term describing a corrected retention time, right? Or the retention time uh, minus your mobile phase uh, time divided by your mobile phase time, 
right? So actually, one way of thinking of capacity factor, it's actually very similar to the retardation factor in TLC, yeah? where T0 is actually uh, your solvent front, the distance traveled by your solvent, or in this case, the time taken for your solvent to reach the detector. Uh, likewise, the selectivity factor at the bottom, oh, sorry, it seems like it's being hidden. Uh, okay, sorry. The selectivity factor alpha, right? is basically your capacity factor or RF of uh, B divided by your capacity factor of A or your RF of A, right? So because B is eluted later, KB is bigger. While A is eluted earlier, KA is smaller. So KB divided by KA will always be a positive number. And the bigger it is, the further away the peaks are, right? So another term that we use to describe uh, chromatography is resolution, right? How well resolved or separated are your two peaks? Uh, if you look at the equation for resolution, it's defined as 2 multiplied by the difference between your retention times divided by the widths, the summed widths of peak A and peak B, right? Now what that means, right, is that the wider your peaks are, the lower your resolution, yeah, because you divide by the sum of widths in your denominator. But in the numerator, the bigger the difference in retention time, that is the center of each peak, right, the better your resolution, right? Because uh, having much more distant peaks actually improves resolution. So ideally, we want peaks that look exactly like this, very sharp, and narrow because it's very clear that each peak is separated from each other, right? So for example, if we take this really tall peak and this really short peak, right? There's no way that we can get confused between either of them because they're so well separated and distant, right? Whereas for this one, if our resolution is not so good, we might get confused. We might not be able to separate these two peaks. Now, if we look at the example at the top of the screen with the green and red peak, we see that uh, although it's very clear that this is a green peak and this is a red peak, right? What if those peaks are overlapping? What if we move them a bit closer together, right? How would you tell which part of the peak belongs to which? That's the main challenge of resolution. We want to separate these compounds as well as possible which is the ultimate goal of any separation in analytical chemistry. So how do we identify what the compounds are in our chromatogram, right? So if the compounds are known, it's quite simple. We can run, uh, oh, sorry, Kali is typing. Mm, what you say? You say something? Oh, okay. No, I'll, I'll just go on first. So if these compounds are known, we can actually double check what these compounds are. So if you remember a thin layer chromatography, right? We can confirm if they are the same sample, if they are the same compound, if they have the same retardation factor or capacity factor. The same thing applies uh, here. Oh, whoops here as well, All right? Uh, compounds with the same uh, retention factor or retention time can be assumed to be the same compound, right? Uh, which, which is even better if you spike your, uh, your sample with internal standards. Now, what that means, right, is that when you run your sample, you insert a little bit of a chemical that's very similar to the one you want to separate that should ideally have the same uh, retention time, yeah? So if you see that the peaks overlap, right? That means that they are uh, corresponding to the same compound. Right? Of course, if these compounds are unknown, we need to determine their structure by some other way, right? So in the field, uh, two of the most common methods are these techniques known as nuclear magnetic resonance as well as mass spectrometry, uh, which I won't go into detail today, 
but eventually I might if I continue with the class. Yeah. So let's uh, check your knowledge, all right? If the stationary phase is non-polar, which of these compounds would have the largest retention time? Now remember that uh, like attracts like, so non-polar will also attract non-polar, which causes it to be retained longer, yeah? So type your answers in the chat and I'll let you know if you're right or wrong. Okay, um, I see someone say anthracene. That's not anthracene. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, that's naphthalene. So, you're an egg. You're an egg, you're wrong. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me reveal the answer to you guys. The answer is actually A. Why? Because, uh, you see, this column, right? Uh, this plate has a very non-polar interaction with the most non-polar compound naphthalene. So it has very strong hydrophobic interactions, right, with the stationary phase. Uh, and uh, the way this is uh, done is actually with a carbon-based stationary phase. So you have uh, plates that are actually coated with hydrocarbons, right? For example, carbon-8 or carbon-18. So you can actually get very good separations of non-polar compounds on these plates. So next question, using a stationary phase coated with uh, selenol groups or SiOH, as well as hexane as the mobile phase, which two of these compounds do we expect to have the strongest separation? Yeah, put your answers in the chat, please. <laughs> Take your time. Uh, just look at the compounds and think about the kind of groups that each compound has. Okay, so a stationary phase is coated with a polar group. So we're trying to separate polar from non-polar molecules, yeah? Now, so basically this question is, uh, which one would have the greatest difference in polarity? Yes, exactly, it's B. So <laughs> obviously B has the most differences in polar groups, right? Uh, one is cytosine, one is uh, aniline. So this one only has one NH2 over here. Or well, this one has several uh, amine groups as well as a uh, double bond O, right? Uh, if you take a look at the top groups, they're more or less the same except with this additional NH2. And these two are actually isotopes. Uh, sorry, um, not isotopes. Uh, what, the word I'm looking for is isomers of each other. Yeah, It's just the OH is shifted from here to the tail, the end of the hydrocarbon. So you won't actually get a very good uh, separation on it. Uh, yes, the ones that have the greatest difference in polarity will have the strongest separation. Good job. So here's another question. Right? Samples 1 and 2 are complex mixtures containing X. Sample 1 has Y and sample 2 has Z. So if Y and Z are of similar polarity but different mass, right? If we separate these samples on TLC plate with low resolution, we likely expect to see which of the following. Right. Take your time, plenty of time, just think it through and put your answers in the chat.
Okay, so does anyone have any clue about the answer? Uh, if you want, you can just uh, unmute your mic as well and just like, speak up. I'll try. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, so why do you say it's D? Why do you think it's D? Why do you guys think it's D? Mm. Okay, uh, let me clarify. Which one is the most likely, right? Which one is definitely the case? Yeah, in A, B, C, and D. Yes, the answer is D. So why is that the case? Well, quite simply because uh, X, right, are definitely in samples one and two. So we definitely expect to see them uh, being the same, right? We expect them to have the same RF. But for Y and Z, they actually get separated based on their mass, yeah? Which means that we cannot be sure that Y and Z will have the same RF, right? In fact, that's usually not the case because the fatter the molecule, right, the slower it travels along the plate, right? That's right. Uh, so actually, right, because I, uh, we mentioned that this is a complex mixture, we cannot be sure that they also contain any other compounds that are of similar RF, right? So the answer is D. Last question, math kind of question, right? So if we take a look at the resolution formula up here, RS, right? Which of the following is true? So here's a hint. If you look at the numerator, this is the difference in retention times. Well, this is the sum of peak widths, all right? So take a look at the question, think about it a bit, and let me know your answer in the chat. Okay, a lot of people are saying E. Uh, why do you think it's E? Why do you think it's E? Let me know in the chat. Just so I know that y'all understand what's going on. <laughs> yes, that's right. Exactly. So uh, as the peaks are more distant, right, you get an increase in the difference in resolution time. And what this means is that your selectivity factor increases, right? If we uh, go back to the selectivity factor formula, uh, which is being hidden by this, sorry. If you go back to the selectivity uh, factor, right, which is defined as KB over KA, right, the further the peaks are away, the larger your selectivity factor and therefore the larger your resolution yeah so actually resolution does not increase with larger peak widths it decreases with larger peak widths because it's in your denominator so when you divide by a big number this number becomes smaller yeah so resolution decreases with larger difference in retention time this is wrong do you know why it's because if this is larger in the numerator RS also becomes larger. Uh, as we've seen with resolution uh, with E, C cannot be correct. And uh, D is definitely wrong because 
D is included in the term itself. Yeah. So uh, let's take a short break and I'll answer your questions in the chat uh, while we wait about for about five to ten minutes. So if you have any questions, please just post them in the chat and I'll get to answering them right away. If you want, you can also turn on your mic and ask me questions to voice. It's fine. Questions, questions. How would you use chromatography to separate enantiomers based on chirality? Okay, uh, so actually, hmm, I don't like that other question, so I'm going to ignore it. But I'm going to ask, uh, I'll answer Hyper's question. Yeah? So how would you use chromatography to separate enantiomers based on chirality? Well, basically, uh, your stationary phase is chiral, right? So it uh, it exerts differential interactions on the different enantiomers, uh, just based on steric factors. For example, uh, we know that enantiomers reflect uh, polarized, or they they interact with polarized light in different ways. Yeah, uh, the similar method also occurs with physical interactions. For example, if you're left-handed, right? you'll have trouble turning uh you'll have trouble using a pen for right-handed people in the same way that you'll have trouble for a left-handed molecule interacting with a right-handed polar phase for instance right polar stationary phase so uh, that's the basis on which we can also separate enantiomers based on chirality yeah um i know this is the first time some of you are hearing about tlc uh thin layer chromatography it's not tender loving care it's really just uh, TLC. Uh, buffers. If you want to separate uh, chiral enantiomers, right, then your stationary phase has to usually be, be chiral. Yeah. Uh, with regards to buffers, right, the buffer, so to speak, that we're using is actually the mobile phase, but it's very common to just use uh, non-buffered mobile phases like hexane or a mixture of water and some other solvent. Yeah. Uh, actually, chemical buffers, right, that could alter the composition of the molecule itself. Uh, those are also quite common in uh, this thing called high pressure liquid chromatography. But I won't be talking about that today because I feel like it will scare a lot of you off. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, today really is just talking about the basics, but yes, there are cases where we use buffers in chromatography, right? For example, uh, ion exchange, right? Ion exchange resins, which uh, you, we actually use quite frequently, right? To separate DNA from lysates, yeah? And that kind of thing. Buffers are extremely common in chromatography. Exactly. exactly. But uh, just for the purposes of separating certain biomolecules, uh, they're not necessary, but they can be very useful for inducing certain chemical properties in the molecules we are interested in studying, our uh, enzymes. Yeah. So sometimes we'll use a buffer to ionize our compounds. We can use buffers to ionize our DNA and give it stronger interactions with the stationary phase. Yeah, that kind. Okay, break time over. I'm going to proceed with class. So is there any point that you guys are very confused by so far? Uh, please just let me know. Yeah? Go proceed first. So now that we've looked at chromatography on a surface, we can actually generalize, generalize this to a column. 
right? So instead of having the stationary phase being just a single coated plate, we can actually have all these little tiny beads inside of our column as the stationary phase, right? So one of the advantages of having a column, a packed column like this, instead of a single plate, is that it increases the surface area, right? It's very dense packing material, right? So because there's so much balls inside our column, we have a lot of surface area for interactions to happen. Yeah. So this actually amplifies the separation. Yeah. So one way of thinking of chromatography is also as a mass transfer process, right? So we know that uh, we have a column like this, right? We can actually separate each uh, part of the column into discrete slices, right? Where the partitioning of an end light between the mobile and stationary phases are in equilibrium. Now that sounds very, very complicated, but we can imagine it as the ratio of end lights that are in the mobile phase versus those that are associated with the stationary phase, right? So if we take a look at this old diagram here, right? Let's imagine this portion is a slice of our column, right? So we'll have some molecules in this slice that are associated with the stationary phase, as well as some that are associated with the mobile phase, right? This is what we call an equilibration. So those are in equilibrium at that time point in the column. These are what we call mm, theoretical plates, right? discrete slices. So if we imagine them as pixels, right, uh, we have more pixels, better resolution. Smaller pixels, better resolution. So the formula for this is given more or less here. So if we take a look at the number of theoretical plates, right, we want to maximize the number of pixels or discrete slices where we have equilibrations. Yeah. In your numerator, we have the retention time. In our denominator, we have the peak width, right? So obviously, to maximize this, we want to make the widths as small as possible, while the retention time as high as possible, yeah? Uh, and each plate, right, we can derive the height of each of these plates or pixels by dividing the length of the column h by the number of plates n. So this brings us to uh, one of the most important equations in chromatography that basically describes the separation of every single possible compound to a physical process, right? Uh, as we know that height of each plate can be calculated through this formula, right? It can also be derived based on three different terms, eddy diffusion, longitudinal diffusion, as well as resistance due to mass transfer which I'll explain uh, each in turn, right? And we'll also see how this uh, uh, corresponds to the flow velocity or how fast our mobile phase is moving to the column, okay? So just to recap, right? We know that our mobile phase is going this way to the column and it's dragging the stationary, uh, it's dragging our end lights along with it. But some end lights are actually interacting with the packing material. Right? They get absorbed onto the surface of the packing material, the stationary phase, right? and they take longer to come out of the column or elute. Right? So that's what we're talking about when we say elution or separation of different end lights in the column. So coming back to this equation, let's see how we can start off with the A term. Right? What is eddy diffusion? Well, in a column, right, these end lights can actually take different paths to the packing material. Some will go this way, some will go this way, and some will go straight through, right? And what this results in, right, because there are so many different paths these molecules can take, is that we end up with peaks that become wider, right? The, uh, this is, of course, not dependent on how fast they flow through the column because ultimately they'll always go through the column at, in different paths, right? It's not dependent on flow velocity. So it's not dependent on you, this U term here. 
that's why we don't have the u term next to the coefficient a right so for open tubular columns with no meaningful stationary phase right no packing right it can only take one path to the column which is straight to there's no packing material for it to go up no packing material to go down if, um, but in a very densely packed column with a lot of different channels eddy channels that these end lights can go to right this a term starts to increase yeah so uh, we say that this term is constant based on the packing material in the column yeah, it's not dependent on how fast the mobile phase is flowing to. It's dependent on how packed the column is. Secondly, uh, it's the longitudinal diffusion term, right? So as N lights travel along the column, right, they spread out along the length of the column because of diffusion, right? This leads to band broadening. So actually, the longer these uh, analytes spend inside the column, right, the longer opportunity you give them to diffuse. Hmm? So actually, this is inversely proportional to flow rate. The higher your flow, the more uh, you, the higher your flow, the less diffusion you get because it doesn't stay in the column so long. But if your flow is very slow, for example, if you just uh, swim down a lazy river, right, and you pee in it, the pee just has a lot of time to spread out, so you basically get a pool full of pee. Uh, that's what we mean by inversely proportional to flow rate. Whereas if the river is moving very quickly, no, no, okay, uh, if the river is flowing very quickly, right, the pee does not spread out as much, it just keeps flowing onwards. Yes, I'm sorry, but this was the best example I could think of. Uh, and lastly, we have uh, the mass transfer term, which is C, right? Uh, don't worry about the S and M at this point in time, right? Uh, just know that resistance due to mass transfer occurs because as the mobile phase flows through the column, right? And lights get separated into two partitions, the stationary phase over here, the ones that are absorbed to the plate or the column packing material, as well as the ones that are inside the mobile phase, right? This is what we were talking about when we mentioned uh, partitioning or equilibration between the stationary and mobile phases, right? So what actually occurs here is that the analytes that are stuck to the stationary phase move much more slowly than the ones that are interacting with the mobile phase, right? which is illustrated over here in this simple diagram. The distribution of particles or analytes in the stationary phase, right, actually appears much slower, it travels much slower than those in the mobile phase. So what happens is that we have two different groups that are moving away from each other, right? It's like uh, when you're running a race, right? One guy is a really fast runner and the other guy has a broken leg. So he moves much, much more slowly. Right, so the faster the flow rate, right, the higher you, uh, the faster your flow rate, the greater this mass transfer process is, right, because uh, the flow is just pushing the guy who can run fast forward much faster, and the guy with the broken leg is just kind of lying down on the floor, right. So what happens is that this term, right, this resistance is actually proportional to your flow rate. The higher your flow rate, the greater resistance. Yeah. So in any given column, right, we want to optimize the flow rate to minimize the height of each plate, right? So based on this equation, right, we can plot out this curve, this blue curve. So the separation or the height of each plate actually depends on the flow rate u. So we have flow rate u in the x-axis and the plate height in the y-axis. Now remember that uh, this plate height, right, is actually analogous to pixels. We want to make them as small as possible. So we look for the flow rate that actually minimizes this curve over here, right? And that flow rate happens to be about uh, 23, 23 milliliters per minute, right? So what this does, right, means that if we use exactly this flow rate, 
we get an ideal separation of our particular and light, right? This is the ideal over here. You all with me so far? Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, I'll just summarize what we've covered so far, all right? At the very start of our class, we did a quick recap about how compounds can be separated based on stationary and mobile phases in thin layer chromatography, right? Now we extended these two interactions involving a detector or along a surface where some uh, and lights interact more strongly with the stationary phase and some interact more strongly with the mobile phase. And that's how we separate these compounds to give us nice little chromatograms like this. Right? We also found out that in order to get the best possible separation, we need these peaks to be very far apart. So there's no ambiguity in telling, oh, are we detecting compound A or are we detecting compound B? The further the peaks are apart, the better the separation. Right? We also noticed that peak width is also a very important factor in resolution. If these widths are very fat, our pixels start to overlap and then our graphics are bad, right? So ideally, we should have very thin, narrow and tall peaks like this, which help us tell our end lights apart as well as possible. Uh, lastly, we moved on to column based chromatography, where it took a look at how molecules passing through a column, right? actually improves the resolution because it increases the surface area right, of the stationary phase. More interactions between the end lights and stationary phase and mobile phase. Yeah. Uh, we also took a look at no, sorry. Uh, we also took a look at theoretical plates, what they mean or like the sort of pixels in chromatography, how we calculate them as well as how we can optimize them uh, through uh, the Van Diemter equation, right? Looking at uh, and light separation based on flow rate. So uh, that's basically all we'll be covering for today. Thank you all so much for joining, uh, joining this class. Uh, I know it's really ad hoc because yesterday I was feeling really bad. Um, so sorry about that. But I hope you managed to learn something. Uh, either way, yeah, uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, uh, but I'll spend the next uh, 15 or so minutes just answering your questions and clarifying any points of doubt.